Alright, let's continue the series by switching things up a bit and flipping the brain upside down. Okay, so let's get right into it. These two little antennae-like structures right here in the front, uh, these are the olfactory bulbs, and they're key for your sense of smell. When you inhale through your nose, air will actually waft all the way up to where the olfactory bulbs rest, and they will sense various molecules in the air before passing the data into the brain along this group of axons here where it will then be perceived as a smell. You may have heard that neurons don't divide. You don't get any more after you're born. They just die off slowly over time and you have less and less. The olfactory bulbs are one of the few areas of the brain where there is postnatal neurogenesis. That is, the generation of new neurons after birth. As you can see in humans, the olfactory bulbs are fairly small. In other mammals, like rats and mice, the olfactory bulb is much larger taking up as much space as its entire brainstem. Consequently, rats and mice have a much better sense of smell than we do. Rats and mice rely on smell as their primary sensory input. They sense the world through smell first, and their other senses second. It's sort of like how we think of the world visually, and then we add other senses to that percept. Now, just behind these olfactory bulbs is the optic chiasm. It's this little X structure right here, where two groups of axons are crossing. These nerves are the optic nerves that come from the retina and take visual information into the brain. The retina is cut off here, but if it was here, each eye would rest about here. It would come in, there would be some optic nerves going in this side, and optic nerves going in this side, and they would cross. This crossing of the optic nerves is known as the optic chiasm, or sometimes the optic decusation. Decusation is just a neuroanatomy term, means to cross the other side. After the optic chiasm, the optic nerve is now referred to as the optic tract. Moving further back posteriorly, we hit the brainstem. Now the brainstem, even though it's fairly small compared to the rest of the brain, is perhaps the most important brain area. I'll go over some case studies of patients with lesions and severe damage to their brain, and how this damage affects their behavior, but you'll notice and I won't ever cover anyone with severe damage to the brainstem. That's because you simply don't survive without a brainstem. People have survived gunshot wounds that go through the brain. Phineas Gage, who we'll talk about later, had a tamping rod shot through his head, and they were able to survive because the areas of the brain that were damaged, while they were critical for complex functions like cognition, language, memory, etc., they're not necessary for regulating their most vital bodily functions. Damage to the brainstem profoundly affects motor and sensory processes, as well as consciousness and the control of sleep. Okay, so in particular what we've hit is the pons of the brainstem. There's a left and a right pons, and they're fairly well divided as you can see here. Just above the pons is the peduncle and the midbrain, I'm not quite sure if you can see that, and below the pons is the medulla oblongata. There's also all these nerves around the brainstem. These are called the cranial nerves. You can't see them so well in the brain, so what I'll probably do is throw up a diagram in editing so that you can follow along. There are 12 cranial nerves in the human brain, and they relay information from your sensory organs to your brain, and they take motor output from your brain to your muscles. Starting from the front, there's the olfactory nerves, which we just covered. Those are cranial nerve number one. Behind these is the optic chiasm, which is part of the optic nerve, cranial nerve number two. Right next to that is number three, the ocular motor nerve, and this innervates muscles around the eyes, which control most of our eye movements. Behind that, we find the trochlear nerve, number four, which controls lateral eye movement. So we've got three eye nerves in a row, the optic nerve taking input to the brain, and then the ocular motor and trochlear nerves, which move the eyes. Now we're going to find number five, the trigeminal nerve, which both takes input from the face and also sends output to control our jaw. And then we're going to be right back to eyes again as we hit the abducens nerve, number six on our list. It's called the abducens because it abducts the eye. Now, it doesn't come in a spaceship and suck it into space. In science, we refer to abducting as moving away from the sagittal plane. Remember, we said that a sagittal cut was along the length of the brain. So, it's used to move your eyes away from this sagittal plane, to your periphery. Number seven the facial nerve is pretty cool because it controls muscles in the face allowing for expression and it seemingly arbitrarily also takes input from the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. Nerve number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve, also does quite a few things. 
In the inner ear, we don't just sense sound. We also sense acceleration and rotation with the semicircular canals. This sense of acceleration and rotation is important for balance and movement, and is known as the vestibular sense, hence vestibulocochlear. Cochlear comes from the cochlea, which senses sound, as we'll get to in a later video. Up next, number 9. Trust me, we're almost done. Just hang in there. Cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve. You remember we said that the facial nerve gets input from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue? Well, the glossopharyngeal nerve gets that posterior one-third that was left over. It also sends output to the stylopharyngeus, allowing you to swallow. Next comes number 10, the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve also gets gustatory taste input, but not from the tongue. The vagus nerve gets input from the epiglottis. The vagus nerve also innervates muscles which control breathing and vocalization, so it's really quite important. Cranial nerve number 11 is the accessory nerve, which innervates muscles in the neck, allowing you to move your head and shrug your shoulders. Finally, number 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. This nerve is really important for speech since it controls the tongue and other muscles important for swallowing and vocalization. Now that's certainly a mouthful of information to go through, so you might want to rewind the video a few times to make sure you got everything. There are a few mnemonics out there to help you remember the order and names of the 12 cranial nerves. The most popular one is, on old Olympus's towering tops, a Finn and German viewed some hops. But I just came across this ridiculous one. Oh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah, heaven. It sounds like a bad translation of something dirty. And perhaps it's because it's so shocking that I've already got it memorized. While we're back here, let's take a closer look at the cerebellum. As I had mentioned earlier, the cerebellum has more neurons in it than the cerebrum, which is what most people think of when they think of the brain. It's this whole area up here that we've been talking about so far. Now, you'll remember from the previous video that I said that neuron bodies are found in gray matter, which we saw on the outside of the brain with all those wrinkles. Well, you can certainly see that the cerebellum is much more wrinkled than the rest of the brain, and so it can fit more gray matter, or cortex, in the same amount of space. This is why the brain has these folds and wrinkles. It's so you can fit as much surface area into a small volume, since our skulls are only so large. In fact, if you look at a human brain, a monkey brain, a cat brain, and then a rat brain, you'll see that there are gradually less and less of these wrinkles, meaning that there's less neocortex in each brain. So, it's not so much how big your brain is that correlates with intelligence, but really how much neocortex you have, which could be represented as the amount and depth of wrinkles multiplied by cerebral volume. So, if we look at a cross-section of the cerebellum, we can see that it's just super wrinkled with tons of folds, and that's how it gets so many neurons packed in such a small area. The telencephalon, or cerebrum of the brain, has about 15 billion neurons, but the cerebellum, even though it's so small, has about 70 billion neurons. That's pretty impressive. Now, you might be wondering what possible function could be so complex that it requires 80% of the brain's neurons. Could it be intelligence? Consciousness? Maybe vision? Nope. In fact, the answer is motor coordination, something that most people take for granted. Motor coordination really is an extremely difficult task to solve. If you've seen Osimo, Honda's bipedal humanoid robot, it walks very slowly and marches upstairs very carefully. Even a small child can run and jump and rush upstairs two at a time. It's because your cerebellum is such a powerful computational machine that you can do this. And you can certainly see why it would have evolved to be so wrinkled. When you're running from a predator or trying to catch prey, it's not going to be your intelligence that's important, it's going to be your motor coordination. Your cerebellum is using all sorts of perceptual information, from proprioceptive information that tells you how extended each of your joints are, to vestibular data about balance from the inner ear, and even visual information, in order to constantly update every series of muscle movements you perform. People with damage to the cerebellum have very rigid and shaky movement, known as cerebellar ataxia. The cerebellum like the olfactory bulbs, also experiences neurogenesis throughout life. In another video, we'll discuss how the brain computes motor behaviors, and we'll talk about the cerebellum in even more detail.